Hey guys, welcome back to Smart Simple Fit. Today we're going to talk about why using machines in your exercise program could give you some next level hypertrophy. Let's jump right into it. So there's four categories of things that I want you to think about in today's video. I'm going to go through them one at a time, but these big picture concepts really involve the, the, the nature of machines making a big difference in your training compared to other exercise modalities such as dumbbells or barbells or calisthenics or weighted calisthenics and some other alternatives and why it's a little bit more unique to this modality and how that can play a very big role in giving you more effective long-term gains, making small yet meaningful changes in how you train. The first of which is recovery. Recovery in an exercise program is a scarce resource and it should be spent wisely. When we talk about recovery, we're talking about the body's ability to bounce back from the damage that we do to our body whenever we have a hard training session and cumulatively when we have many training sessions within a training period block. Whether you plan to divide your training up into you know, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, whatever it is that you think about, or maybe you don't think about training blocks at all, either way, there is a cumulative effect where stress adds up to your body over time and that has an effect those little stresses, whether it's in your lower back, your knees, your adductors, your quads, whatever it is, your elbows, your wrists, perhaps, maybe it's just overusing a muscle or a tendon. These things are consequential, more so in the long run than in the short term. And certainly the longer you train, as you become more of an intermediate lifter and advanced and beyond, that's where you're going to need to think harder about managing recovery. Although even as a beginner, it is possible to have an overuse injury. So recovery, we're talking about not just training hard and, and effective. We're not just tra talking about sleep. We're not just talking about good quality nutrition and warm ups and cool downs and whatever. Uh, but we're talking about how to actually spend your body's resources on a week to week basis in order to get the most out of your investment. You can think about it like this exercises that are more conducive to recovery or let's say have a lower recovery cost are going to give you a better trade-off for the investment you put into it. Maybe it's never a perfect one-to-one, -one, you know, a unit of fatigue or stress to the body versus a unit of, you know, adaptation, whether that's hypertrophy or strength. But what we can think about is this, if you're doing something like a front squat, which involves a lighter weight and puts you in a position where there's less stress on your lower back and hips, that may be very, very useful from a recovery standpoint compared to back squatting, especially low bar, where the stress on the lower back is much greater and the weight used on the bar tends to be much higher. Now, is there a trade-off in terms of getting less adaptation out of the front squats? Some would say yes, because it's using a lighter weight, but I think the biggest thing you'll be losing is specificity for competition style squatting. So if you don't care about competing in powerlifting, maybe you shouldn't be using the maximal weight variation that's very, very hard in recovery, which is the case for low bar squatting. Now more specifically, people will look at machines, right? That's what today's topic is about, not differences in barbell exercises. People will talk about stabilizers and they'll say, well, the machines don't stimulate your stabilizers as much and you don't have to balance a weight. So maybe you're losing a serious benefit by not working your stabilizers as hard as barbell or dumbbell training or moving your body throughout space, which you do in calisthenics. And that may very well be the case. However, as you continue to get stronger and bigger over time, what you'll start to realize is that the fundamental movement patterns of exercise, those being horizontal pull and push, vertical pull and push, uh, squat and hip hinge movement patterns, they share resources, which means that if you want to focus on those things to 
maximize improvements over time, the limiting factor between some of these move movement patterns is the fact that they share stabilizers. Squatting and hip hinging both put significant stressors, or can, onto your lower back. Same thing is true for the elbows with pressing or the biceps tendons uh, with the both of the pulling movement patterns. So if a machine is more gentle on your stabilizers, it's going to allow you to push yourself more in a way that is, is limited by your ability to lift the weight, like how fast your strength is actually improving, and actually the damage being done to the muscle bellies and maybe the muscle tendons of the prime movers themselves, and not being limited by, say, rotator cuffs or elbows as much. So that is a big benefit, potentially. Now, technique demand tends to also be lower on exercise machines, which means in nature, you can grind them out a little bit. If you're familiar with my content before, you've probably seen that I don't actually typically recommend people go to failure. I do recommend people train hard, and I mean hard, right? If you've seen what a hard set looks like, it looks hard. It looks like it's pretty close to failure, uh, but it, the way it feels is sometimes misleading. You might think you're training at an RP9 or 10, but in reality, it's only a seven or an eight. That's probably the case for deadlifting and squatting, but you, you're going to undershoot your RPE, and this probably leads people to think that training below failure means training like a wimp, but it doesn't. On machines, however, I definitely recommend you grind it because you don't really have to worry about safety concerns like re-racking weights. Um, the, it's usually a fixed plane of motion. It's a very predictable, smooth feeling. Um, often the seats and the angles of grips are adjustable, so you can really make it fit to your body individualized. So even though you lose freedom of movement, if it's a good quality machine, and most machines in the gym are actually pretty good in this regard, you can adjust it to fit your body pretty good. And some of them, like an overhead press machine, you can actually choose between like this wider, sort of like a, a barbell style of grip versus more like a Swiss bar or neutral grip that you could do with a Swiss bar or dumbbells. So there's actually a good bit of variety and individualization, even though machines do technically restrict your movement. But because the technique demand is higher or lower, I should say, you can definitely grind those suckers closer to failure, which I think from a hypertrophy standpoint, it's a healthy mindset to have, especially on isolations, to get that much closer to failure or even to go to it. Now, high frequency, in my opinion, overall is usually overrated, especially when you see it recommended for things like squatting and benching. I think high frequency sets you up to uh, lose some mobility in your shoulders and develop some pain in your shoulders and elbows. And, and what you see a lot with like high volume squat and bench protocols is people end up feeling pretty beat up in their stabilizers, in their, their weakest points in their body. And perhaps if they spent more time doing things like leg extensions, leg press machines to accumulate volume for their quads, they wouldn't need to squat so frequently in order to get the result they're looking for. And that right there is a huge benefit for hypertrophy when it comes to the machines. It's very gentle on your body in some ways, and you can grind it out for that extra volume to boost your main lifts if we're talking about barbells being the main movements. Same is true for bench press. If you're not using some sort of chest fly machine or pec deck or hammer plate loaded press, uh, you're missing out on that juicy, more or less isolated volume that's easier to recover from that would probably, in effect, uh, decrease your need to train the bench press so often and, and not, you know, then if you use those machines more, your shoulders would probably feel better. That's my opinion. I don't necessarily have any empirical evidence to support it, but I think anecdotally, probably a lot of you guys can attest to those experiences. Just hammering out more bench and more squats can certainly work, but it is not without serious consequences. Machines also protect and spare overall the, the limiting factors. Again, that goes hand in hand with the stabilizers. So when you are, when you are limited by, let's say how much weight you can comfortably load onto your shoulders for a uh, front squat or, or balance width, uh, or in the case of bench press, how much you can safely get on and off the rack, 
versus the machine where you're already set up and in position, whether that's for leg pressing, hack squatting, uh, some sort of plate loaded chest press. I mean, it's just plug and play. You don't need a spotter with a machine, but you do need spotters uh, for barbell exercises, depending on what you're doing. Now, it's not, a, it's not a massive difference as far as like setup being a limiting factor on exercise, but as far as like the safety of re-racking weights, definitely that can be a limiting factor. And the other limiting factors we already talked about, which would be like the resources of your joints, tendons, soft tissues. They tend to be extremely accessible, machines that is. Even if you don't have a lot of experience in the gym, you don't really know how to train, you can pretty much just sit down on any exercise machine and start working hard. You don't need to go through this like phase of whether it's deadlifting, squatting, benching, overhead pressing, where you, you spend a lot of time doing technique work just to make sure you're, you're lifting safely and effectively and you're developing efficient mo movement patterns. And I don't think that's a bad thing about barbell training. I actually love it. I, I think it's good that a, a trainee learns how to move this object through space efficiently and, and safely, but it certainly is a is an entry level cost. It's a it's a barrier to entry that isn't there with the machines because you can pretty much effectively work out with machines the very first time you use it, almost completely irrespective of your experience level. So that's very useful. And of course, as we've already talked about, they can be very, very adjustable to suit your body's needs. They may in fact even reduce the need for deload. So one of the benefits of deloading in an exercise program, in my opinion, is that let's say with deadlifting, it gives your lower back and your SI joint a break. That's very helpful. Uh, another one would be for bench pressing. Again, it gives your shoulders, your pec tendons, your elbows, a little bit of a break. So it's allowing some of the, the, the weakest parts of your body, the most beat up parts of your body to recover before you do like a strength assessment or before you go into a next block or training phase, um, it allows you to heal those areas that are starting to, uh, they're starting to fall apart a little bit. But if we're being easier on those parts of our body because we're using machines to get jacked and stacked or at the very least using them as accessories or secondary lifts in a program, well, that may very well reduce your need to deload in terms of how often you deload, how many days you deload, how many sessions you deload, uh, what percentage of weight you take off the bar when you deload, or maybe in some cases, if you're like natural hypertrophy or other folks who essentially never deload, you may find a balance where you don't feel a need subjectively to deload at all. I'm not saying that's a good recommendation, but it appears that some people can make that work. Okay, beyond recovery, I think that machines are super underrated overall here on YouTube Fitness and as far as lower body training goes. Maybe there's a case to be made that for like hip hinges, there aren't a lot of machines that help you get very jacked, although hamstring curls uh, come to mind. Um, and this wouldn't necessarily technically be, be a machine, but like back extension chairs, the 45 degree uh, or the glute ham raise. Those aren't really machines. I mean, they're, they're just like a nice setup for your body to, to do basically like a weighted calisthenic. But either way, there, there are some things you can do for your back and your glutes and your hamstrings that are machines, but, but at least for the quads, right? The squat movement pattern, and then even training smaller movements like the good girl, bad girl machines. These are such great tools to get big, strong, juicy legs. And if you're only doing barbell squatting and deadlifting, you're missing out on areas of your physique. While it's true that growing your hamstrings, quads, and your glutes is gonna make a big difference in how you look if you always skip your calves because you never isolate your soleus or you never do anything for the, the gastroc muscle. If you never train the inner thigh and the outside of the glutes, you're missing out on some stabilizer work. Again, isolating those on those smaller muscles that might help with strength in the, in the weakest position on the exercise, maybe it's the bottom of the pocket on the squat, or maybe the, the stabilizer is just going to help you uh, lock out your deadlift better, some people might say, and having more jacked calves is certainly going to help you look more jacked overall. So it, it, these things get underplayed and undervalued because people will just say, eh, just go do compound movements or just go do barbell movements. And it's true, those work so effectively. But if you add in the machines, it's going to take you to the next level, especially for quads, hack squats, leg presses, 
Uh, even Smith machines are highly underrated, and I'm not necessarily suggesting you can or should replace uh, back squatting or front squatting with those things. But if you use them in addition to, uh, if you use machines in addition to those barbell movements, you'll probably feel better, and you'll you'll start to realize you have certain weaknesses. Maybe it's high rep sets. Okay, if you've never done sets of squats that go to 20, okay, for that. Maybe it, maybe that's just cardio or maybe there's a hypertrophic benefit either way, right? That high rep strength, perhaps just for the sake of hypertrophy, maybe you're more likely to commit to that if you have the security of a Smith machine and security of a leg press, security of a hack squat. That way you don't have to worry about racking and unracking the weights after a killer set where you're exhausted, right? You can just, and that's it, put it away. So that could be a big benefit. And I think that these things are easy to make fun of, right? Tom Platz talks about how uh, leg pressing is an inferior movement. Nothing compares to squats. You can do leg presses, but why? Why do an inferior movement? And he's not exactly wrong if we're talking about one movement being the thing to develop the quads. But guys, it's your program. You can pick as many movements as you want. I think one or two or three for muscles, each muscle is probably adequate, but doing just one is probably leaving you with some weaknesses. It's gains on the table, and here in this video, we're, we're trying to maximize the gains. So consider using a machine, find one that feels good, that's fun. I don't think that any one of them is necessarily amazing and one of them is terrible. I just think you need to experiment and find one that feels good for you. So squats are amazing, but they're very, very fatiguing. And the lower fatigue or the lower uh, entry entry cost, right, on a squat, if you can't squat deep uh, because of flexibility or because of butt wink, it's going to take time to iron that out. But on the leg press and the hack squat and the Smith machine, you can probably push yourself harder earlier on in your program. And if you develop injuries or mobility problems that you need to work out, the machines are going to be a reliable way to be, go just a little bit easier on your body throughout that period of time until you fix those issues. And in a sense, machine accessories have such a low recovery cost, it's kind of like free gains. The cost is you have to actually go do them. You can't just skip them every single workout and then be surprised that they don't give you gains. Uh, something comes to mind just as simple as hamstring curls and leg extensions. It's easy to look at a program that has those at the end and just like ab training be like, eh, I don't want to do them today and then not get the benefit. But if you commit to doing them with slow, controlled reps, a juicy amount of weight going close to failure, writing everything down, planning progressions, putting just as much intent into it as you would with biceps curls or another exercise that you care more about, you're going to get a lot more out of it. High rep caveman sets are for studs. I forgot I wrote that one down. But yeah, if you do like a, a squat workout, where you have like three sets of eight on, on high bar squats or front squats, and then finish off with like two sets of 20 with like a really hard amount of weight on leg press, where by 20 you're like, you've got shaky jello legs, man, that is gonna level up your quads. And you've probably heard people talk about how quads can take a volume beating. They are savage muscles that you can just hammer like hard and frequently. And as long as your knees and adductors aren't bothering you, the squat movement pattern, you can really load like crazy. So these high rep sort of just unga bunga sets where you're just trying to just grind through the reps, machines, are, it's very intuitive to do that. It's straight up and down, back and forth. There's not a lot that can go wrong as long as you pay attention and, pay, and <laughs> when you're getting close to failure, uh, get ready to uh, use those safeties. So in addition to that, they may very well expose some weaknesses. We've already covered that. Uh, so go ahead and give the machine a try. Who needs bench press? Not really. Do you really want to commit to competition style bench press if you fall into this category of people? And I think this is a lot of people. If you're willing to continually, you know, develop bouncier reps and a bigger arch and a wider grip and and a more intense leg drive, and then eventually you start lifting your butt off the bench. There's a lot of compensatory things that are bad habits for people to fall into almost exclusively when we're talking about the bench press. Now, technically you can cheat almost any movement, almost any exercise 
But I think the bench press leads so many guys into this, this, this rabbit hole of like, oh, I'll just cheat a little bit more. I'll just bounce it a little bit. I'll just lift my glutes up off the bench a little bit. I'll just go a little bit wider. Everything to squeeze out an extra pound or five pounds onto the bench just to feel stronger. And then your shoulders start to ache. Your elbows are hurting more. Your wrists are hurting more. And you're not necessarily seeing more hypertrophy. So I ask you this, do you even need to be bench pressing at all? Or could you simply be doing other exercises like dumbbell bench, weighted push-ups, and with machines, things like plate-loaded chest presses, basement bodybuilding seems to love them, old Omni Man loves the hammer, hammer incline press. Now, not necessarily people are out there in a hurry to be like, oh yeah, this is a total one-to-one -one replacement of bench, but you know what? If you're just interested in growing your chest, I don't see why machines would do a bad job, and if you grow your chest enough, eventually your bench press will grow up. Uh, but if you're going to commit to bench press, don't be content with sloppy garbage reps. So you're going to need to become very, very anal retentive about making your reps high quality, doing things like paused benches, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So yeah, bench press is absolutely a Chad tier lift, but there's a lot of temptation to do bad stuff. Grinding yourself into pieces. We've talked about doing high frequency being overrated, just doing more bench press might not solve your problems. In fact, it might lead to more. Isolations, right? Like we've been talking about. It's easy volume. It's almost free gains. So if you do your bench press workout after like three good working sets, if you finish off with two or three more sets of chest flies or hammer press, that's going to feel really, really good. And it's going to give you those extra gains that more sets of bench or more days of bench may or may not have given you and probably without the negative consequences of just grinding that movement to pieces. Chasing strength standards. Aha. Now there's a lot of talk about what a good bench is, right? 315 used to be a really impressive thing. It still is. And now you see a lot of guys natural on YouTube hitting numbers like 350, even some folks hitting 405. That's very impressive. But if you're just telling yourself, oh, I'll have a big chest when I get to 405, Guys, you were talking about years away, especially if it's your first year or two of training. That is years away. Maybe not 10 years away, but probably at least like five. So don't just think to yourself, got to get that number, got to get that number. And when we're talking about machines, strength standards don't really exist. So one of the benefits of using machines to get jacked on the horizontal pressing movement pattern is you're not going to be thinking about numbers and comparing yourself to other people as much which will allow you to focus on the quality of your reps, what you're doing, stay in the moment, do a good job, don't cheat, just, just do a good set, get it done, write it down, show up and work a little bit harder. So the fact that there aren't strength standards, quote unquote, for machines is actually probably a huge benefit, at least psychologically, if nothing else. Of course, we know there's plenty of good ways to develop your chest, whether it's machines or barbells, or with dumbbells, but you just you just need to find some things that work for you. The only thing I would maybe recommend staying away from for chest is like, I don't know, resistance band only. Uh, but yeah, dips, push-ups, it all works just fine, guys. But you need to find something that feels good, that you enjoy, and you keep yourself honest. Okay, last category is the legendary back gains that machines are gonna give you. Some people will say just do pull-ups. I think that's great advice, but it has limits. If the person is doing like weighted pull-ups or bodyweight pull-ups and they start developing like technical idiosyncrasies or a lot of compensations where they're willing to kip to get the weight up or they're just barely getting their, their nose or their chin to the bar in order to do a really heavy set, of, a heavy PR for weighted pull-ups, maybe they're doing CrossFit style pull-ups. These are all terrible habits that will hurt your ability to develop your back and probably lead to more overuse injuries, whether that's in your hands, your upper back muscles, your biceps tendons, uh, because you'll be loading those things more than you need to in order to get gains, and you won't actually be working your lats more necessarily, or at least not in a way that's manageable subjectively. So if you do things like slow, full range of motion, chest to bar, lat pull downs, that is a very controlled environment for you to get a juicy pump in your back. Again, people talk about iliac pull downs. Oh, this nice slow squeeze where you're getting your elbow tucked to your body in the bottom position. You know what else you can do that? A lat pull down where you just simply touch your chest, puff it out a little bit. It's 
probably the exact same benefit as iliac pull downs, but you get to train two arms at a time. So that being said, iliac pull downs are nerds, just do chest to bar movements. It could be pull ups, right? Chest to bar pull ups, sternum pull ups, excellent way to grow your, up, your upper back. And so are pull downs. Pull downs are very, very underrated. In addition to that, straight arm pull downs with the lat pull down machine are a slept on S tier accessory movement where you isolate the lats. And this would be something where just like we talked about bench press, do your main sets, do a few sets, and then do a few more sets isolating it. So you wouldn't open up with like five sets of straight arm pull downs, but maybe if you do three sets of chest to bar uh, pull downs or pull ups, and then do a few sets of straight arm pull downs. You're talking about juicy lat gains, guys. You're not gonna need to do much more than that to grow your lats. Machine rows, okay, this is one of my favorite things I've ever seen, is whether it's seated cable rows um, or this uh, vertical rowing machine that I've recently started using, it feels so good. And it's like a seal row, but you get to sit upright so you don't feel like this, as much of like a crushing sensation in your chest. I don't know, maybe I'm just a baby. And you feel like you can breathe better, you don't have blood rushing to your head, and you don't have to do an annoying seal row setup with like, like stealing all the plates in the gym <clears throat> or, uh, or or having to like jury rig your bench somehow or buy a crazy expensive seal row uh, bench or who knows, maybe there's a seal row bench in your gym, there isn't in mine. And this machine allows you to get some really nice volume for your upper back without having to do bench over rows. They're a good exercise, so are pen lays, but it's unmistakably clear that something like this machine row or seal row is going to be a lot easier to recover from. So those movements are very much slept on. And one more for the upper back, reverse fly machine. Okay, this is, in my opinion, much, much, much better than dumbbell reverse flies, which have kind of a goofy strength curve, kind of like a triceps kickback. Not a terrible exercise, but the machine is gonna give you more of that, maybe this term is uh, overused, constant tension, okay? You actually feel the work being done throughout the range of motion, a lot more since it's a machine and not just a dumbbell working against gravity. So all of those movements are very, very much slept on and underrated. If you use some of these machines in your training, you'll probably see a tangible improvement in your back gains. So that being said, thank you so much for joining me today. I don't think any machine is necessary to include in your program, but if you pick and choose some good ones that match your goals, match your current training, uh, that you have access to, whether it's the gym, you're probably not going to have machines at home, um, or, you know, just based on preference, you experiment with a few, you will start to enjoy your program more. And guys, if you're, if you've been training for a few years and it's starting to get stale, starting to get certain overuse injuries, I really am pleading with you to try some machines. They're fun and they're definitely uh, easier on your body. Okay. So don't sleep on machines. They can give you some next level hypertrophy. Try them out next time you're in the gym. That's all I've got for you. So if you haven't checked out the rest of the Smart and Simple Lecture Series playlist, I suggest you do so right now. Like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.